kids. We're back to doing stuff we have no business trying to do. The plan here is to try and make a giant cone out of that piece of metal. It's likely not going to work. But I thought we ought to try to understand some of the math here. It took me a really long time to figure this out. Lots of internet searching. But basically, you're going, we're going to make what's called a frustum, I think, or a truncated cone, right? So you're making a conical shape, but we're going to cut this section up here right there. So you got to do some math to hand draw this out. Now, you can print templates off the internet. There's all kinds of calculators in there, but this is a really big piece. I'm not going to go to a print shop and have them print a template out, so I decided I'll just try and hand draw this out. So what you need to know are the dimensions of the cone that you want to make. So you want to know the height. So in this model here, we made it four inches. You want to know the width or the diameter of the base. So the largest chunk of the cone, the largest opening of the cone. In this instance, we use four inches as well. Then you want to know the diameter of the smallest opening. In this instance, two inches, right? So you're going to start by drawing a straight line the width of your base which is four inches in the middle of that at a right angle you're going to draw a line equal to the height of your cone so four inches here the top of that you're going to draw a line the width of your smallest opening two inches the middle of which is intersecting with this line here then you're going to lay your straight edge down and from this point to that point, you're going to draw lines on either side to the point that they intersect right up here. Now, this is just to lay out geometry. The way you're going to create the pattern is you're going to put your protractor up here. In this instance, I didn't have a protractor that long. So I'll put a pin in here, laid my ruler against it, and I started right down here at the base of this first line and I made an arc all the way around. I repeated that process starting here and ending here and arcing around. That's going to give us the first portion of our template here, right? So the next thing you have to do is figure out the circumference of the base right here of your cone. So what you got to do is you multiply A, which is your diameter, by pi to get 12.56 inches. And that's going to be your circumference. So if you've got a cone with a 4-inch diameter base, the circumference of the, the base of that cone is going to be just over 12 and a half inches. Now, how do you mark out 12.56 inches along this curved line? Your tape measure is not going to do that, and you're sure not going to do it accurately with this. So what you can do is you pick some arbitrary number. I mean, it needs to be big enough that your intervals end up being small enough to manage. You call these arcs. So I picked 20 because it gave me a reasonable number there. So you're going to divide 12.56 by 20. And that's going to give you 0 0.628 inches. Now this would obviously be a little easier if we were working in metric, but we're not a bunch of communists here. So, I used uh, my micrometer here, or my caliper rather, to set at 6.28. Now, a good real protractor is going to have some intervals up here that you can use to measure that. This one doesn't. So anyway, did that, marked it out, locked it down, and then you're going to walk this along the arc for the base of your cone. So basically, you're going to stick the pointy ends down, flush on your material, and pivot it. And you can see I've made marks all the way along it. So you're going to walk it all the way along this. And you're going to do that the number of times you divided that circumference by, so 20 times. So did that 20 times until we got all the way to the top up here. This is my 20th mark right here. It's my last arc. So then what you're going to do is line this up with the tip of your triangle down here and draw a line over to your last arc. 
and that will finalize the template. So this section right here, this curved piece in between this line and this line, is going to be the material you'll need to fold around on itself and create a cone with a 4 inch opening base and 2 inch opening top that is 4 inches tall. I think, anyway. So the next step is to translate it to this big piece of metal. All right. Now, is this starting to make any sense to you? No? Yeah, me either. But that's the uh, rough shape. We're just going to very slowly work this, probably around some PVC pipe to bend it up into shape. And we'll see how it goes. All right, kids. We've got it laid out. We've got it cut up. We got it shaped and we got it riveted. It actually looks like a cone or a frustum or whatever. So, cut some flanges down here. Basically, I made that little dotted line one inch out for my measurements and bent this down. The idea is to use those to attach it to the other pieces of this contraption. What we're going to do now is I'm going to put a new impeller in. I bought a bigger impeller that's meant to go on a wind uh, dust collector. It's a pretty common modification for these types of collectors. It's supposed to make it you know, more effective. I'm also going to adapt this to fit onto the six inch hose, or sorry, six inch pipe over here. So um, what we need to do is cut this out. And uh, instead of trying to cut around the top of this thing, I turned this upside down and I laid that on there and centered it as best I could and marked a line out so that I can attach this ducting flange or a takeoff uh, to adapt it for six inches. So I'm gonna, we're gonna drill a hole in here to get started. Use a metal blade on the jigsaw here and just cut that out and then we'll screw this on. Probably take a file to these edges and clean that up a little bit before we uh, mount the flange on. Just filing this down and realize there's still a little bit of this old takeoff that was, I'm going to assume, was uh, pack welded in there or something. But anyway, I'm afraid that that's going to fly off and end up in my impeller at some point in the future. So we're going to try to pry that off of there. All right, so we're going to mount this flange on here. Now, the clearances underneath this, relative to that impeller on there, are pretty small. I mean, you don't really have a lot of space, so I'm going to put some rivets in here versus trying to get a screw to fit in there without protruding too far. All right, so we got our gear puller set up here on our... Uh, uh, old impaler and hopefully this thing will come off in a gigantic fight but I just have to see. This, like a lot of other shafts driven pieces of equipment, is keyed. So you've got this little key right here. It's the block that sits up above the surface of that shaft. And the main thing here is just to make sure that's lined up with the, uh, the uh, new impeller. And that's really about all there is to it other than probably going to have to use a little hammer persuasion to get it in there. All right.
Then we got this little cap and uh, cap screw to go on. Now this one is uh, reverse threaded, so it's tidy, loosey, lefty, righty. Yeah, that's right. So we got the takeoff on there, got the new impeller in. I had pre-made this box to hang on the wall uh, to mount the motor, the uh, blower itself with. So now what we got to do is fabricate something to hold the motor still. So I've got a few pieces of MDF I've glued up here, put a little angle on to secure it to the box, and uh, use the old motor mounts that were on the base of this originally. And we're going to mark, I've got a little template marked out here. I've already started one hole. Um, and we'll drill these out so that we can bolt this to uh, that board. And then on the back side, I'm just going to glue and screw a strip on the bottom. Just as another way of uh, reinforcing that. Um, I made this so that I can remove the top because inevitably there's going to be some changes made to this. So I've got some weather seal here. Um, so when I put the top back on, it kind of closes that off, keeps it airtight. The idea here is that this is going to mount onto the outlet of the motor itself. So the air will blow into here and down through this hole and into the filter. The filter will be mounted on the bottom. And I put this slant in here because allegedly, according to my minimal research, creates less air resistance if it's blowing into a slant here rather than you know four corners in the back so this is going to help reduce turmoil in here i don't know it's just what i was told So there it is. It works, kids. A few things to do. I'm going to paint this at some point. Uh, obviously, we got to get the ducting uh, run out through the rest of the machines. Figure out a system to clamp this lid down. I'm going to put some uh, casters on the bottom of this barrel. I got a bunch of those hanging around. So that's about it, though. All right. So we got it together. Make a little assessment here. Um, if you're going to buy a two horsepower cyclone dust separator system, you can buy these all in one package. It's got the cyclone separator built into it. it usually has a bag or filter involved there too. I don't know how the filters function on those. They're probably not rated for as fine a filtration as the one we've installed here. But looking around on the internet, at some some well-known like reliable brands you can get a two horsepower cyclone dust separator from grizzly for like 1400 and uh it's portable it's all one package uh you know if you want to take a route like this that i did you can buy just the cyclone separator oneida sells those they have a plastic version a very similar size to what we made here the same outlet size for six inch ducting it's 300 for that. So what we made here was essentially free. I mean, I, most of it's just scrap from the shop. You know, you could probably try to figure out what this would cost, but I'm not gonna attempt that. These things are just laying around. The metal was in the weeds out back here. The wood was all wood I had left over from other projects or, you know, whatever. So I'm gonna say that the cost of those was already accounted for in those other projects. Operating on that, other than some tubes of silicone and the two flanges there, which were pretty cheap by 10 bucks, you know. 
So you know, maybe $30, including the flanges and the silicone that I used, is all it costs to make that cone. Now, if you don't have a rivet gun, if you don't have rivets, if you don't have sheet metal, if you don't have wood laying around, is it worth it? No, probably not. I would imagine if you had to go buy all of those things to make this, it's going to be as much, if not more, than what you would pay to just buy the cyclone separator itself from Oneida or some other company. So, no, not worth it. But I'm glad I did it, because we learned some cool stuff. Never expected this was going to work, and it did. So, if you got everything laying around, all of the stuff that we used here, shoot, shoot for it. Do it. It's probably worth it. But it's not worth it if you don't. Now, if you look at the whole system, I got the motor off of Facebook pretty cheap. Um, already had the barrel laying around. Already had most of this wood laying around. So, you know, paid for the filter, the motor, some gaskets and other random parts and pieces that I bought. All told, probably cost around $500.